So welcome to a really exciting edition of PaulHobra.com where we have uh, Amol Saxena here from the United States who's a, um, a surgeon, a podiatrist. Uh, he, he does an immense amount of research and a large portion of that actually into shockwave therapy and surgery. And we want to talk today specifically about the Achilles, plantar fasciopathy, maybe we'll have time to get into medial tibial stress syndrome. Um, you'll have struggled to have done any kind of research on shockwave and the Achilles or plantar fasciopathy without, without a mole's name coming up. So without, without further ado, we're going we're gonna to welcome a mole and get him to talk a little bit about himself. So he'll do a much better job than me. So welcome, Emol, to paulhobra.com. How are you? Good. Uh, happy tea time. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's the morning for you, right? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, so, thanks so much for taking time out of your, your busy morning to come and chat to us. I, I wonder if you might, um, putting modesty to one side, just give us uh, a bit of a bio, the, the, the who's who of Amol Saxena. Uh, well, let's see. I've uh, been in practice a little over 30 years. Um, I actually got interested in podiatry uh, by being a injured runner. And in the 80s, a lot of the runners were getting back running by the, through the help of podiatrists. And um, when I was in uh, college at Washington University of St. Louis, I got introduced to a podiatrist who helped me and a lot of my teammates. And in my hometown, we had two really well-known prominent orthopedic surgeons who were just uh, saints and they had no, um, no animosity towards any, anybody who was helping people get back running because they, they weren't really into treating runners and doing foot surgery. So they encouraged me that podiatry actually might be something I was, uh, would be good at. So that's why I pursued that career. And um, throughout my career, I, I was very interested in finding out uh, how to keep people running or get people back running. And um, the first question whenever a runner has an injury is, how soon can I run or can I run? And um, there's basically nothing on most of the things I treat uh, up until I started delving into that. And uh, so that's why I decided to focus my research on. And uh, one of my mentors, Fred Bailing, said, you know, you don't do research to prove something. You do research to see what you find. And um, being a runner, the numbers don't lie. So I took the same approach to research as just see what the numbers show. And uh, I definitely was interested in Achilles issues, which are very common in runners. And uh, I was fortunate. I came back to my hometown. I actually started in private practice because the, the group I joined eventually wasn't ready to take uh, me on. Um, so I built up my practice and worked with this, these two orthopedic surgeons and a couple other guys in that group uh, quite closely with the Stanford athletes and the coach at the time. It's kind of just all fit together. The coach at the time was this very well-known coach named Brooks Johnson. And he had me treat his athletes and there were a lot of good runners. Uh, in fact, in the area we had um, in the 1992 Olympic trials, we had 18 marathoners uh, in the Olympic trials for, from basically one area. And um, in 1998 or 90, uh, I think 94, they started this uh, club called the Farm Team, uh, which was a Nike sponsored team. And Jeff Johnson came in and um, I treated a lot of their runners and they had a lot of uh, good success. So throughout my career, I've been surrounded by good athletics uh, teams and treating professional athletes. Uh, so that, that just fueled my passion to figure out the outcomes and see where you can push the envelope because runners always want to know how soon can I get back. And, um, yeah, I just kept, uh, documenting my outcomes and evaluating them kind of like, you know, test races or time trials. And, you know, when someone says, oh, I get a hundred percent results uh, to me, that's like, they're saying they can run a four sub four minute mile, but they're running on their 360 meter track or they can dunk a basketball, but the hoop's not 10 feet. So I like, I like to, you know, I don't, I don't really trust stuff unless it's really in writing and revert reviewed or published in a third party in a peer reviewed type of uh, situation. I, um, I, well, I was just going to say, and this, this things just kept falling into place with, um, uh, 
meeting a German guy named Kai Ohms who invited me to Germany, meeting other German surgeons. And then I coincidentally met Ludger Gertesmeyer and Nick Mafuli at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons meeting, which I was actually the first podiatrist to lecture at that in 2002. And I actually lectured on Achilles surgery and runners. And um, started uh, connecting with those guys on research projects. Ludger was, uh, you know, a really good athlete, runner and cyclist and triathlete. So we combined quite a bit. And then in 2006, um, the uh, family that uh, developed the Alter G or anti gravity treadmill, uh, the daughter was a patient of mine. I'd operate on her for a Liz Franks injury. They asked me to help them. And then that was the same time Alberto Salazar started looking me up and coming down with his athletes. And he was involved with the Alter G. And then at the same time, coincidentally, is when we started the Shockwave uh, clinical trial to get approval for the uh, Duolith or the uh, ESWT. And so in 2006, it was kind of a watershed year with all those three things happening and uh, just kept catapulting uh, my career and, and uh, fueling the fire. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and, you know, speaking of uh, Nicola Mafuli and, and Luca Gerdesmeyer, who are people that, again, like your own name, will crop up in research titles over and over again. Uh, are, are there other people in that academic community that, that you've worked with that have, have gone on to do lots of stuff in, in Shockwave as well? Are there other kind of... Um, yeah, um, you know, Carson Knobloch, we haven't written anything together, but they, uh, he and Ligger want me to work on a book on EMTT because uh, I've, I've helped with a couple studies with that. Um, but in the... Podiatry world, it's it's pretty few and far between that uh, people are motivated or doing the type of clinical research. The, the, a lot of the best research on diabetic foot is being done by podiatrists, and that's something I do absolutely nothing of. I, I joke, I see skin, but I don't treat it. So yeah. I treat I treat uh, athlete's feet, but not athlete's foot. So, <laughs> so I like it. Uh, I mean, I'm being facetious. That's not entirely yeah. true, of course, but uh, yeah. And what you mentioned that you've you've worked with some some top athletes, and I I know some of the people you you've worked with before, but it it would be wrong if if I were to mention their names. So are there people that you can you can name drop so we we get a, a good understanding? I, mean, I know you've worked on various different projects and stuff, but I'll, I'll leave you to say what you feel is appropriate. Yeah, anybody that's mentioned me in media themselves and credited me, I'm 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 happy to me mention on my website, uh, amalsuxana.com. I've got pictures of the people who have acknowledged me, and I, I appreciate them. I've I actually Gail and Rupp started uh, uh, seeing me in 2006, so I've been his podiatrist and surgeon for 14 years. And uh, Paula Ratcliffe, I've done two different types of things on her. Um, yeah, I've, I've been fortunate. I've operated on three Olympic gold medalists and um, treated uh, treated uh, several Olympic medalists and gold medalists. Uh, Matthew Centrowitz um, had an interesting ramp up from a full blown tibial stress fracture from stress fracture to Olympic gold medalist in 17 weeks, which was pretty incredible. Um, we actually wrote that up as a case study. Uh, and so, um, yeah, and, and it goes beyond track and field or athletics. So that's my passion. I've treated a lot of professional uh, footballers, you would call them, or soccer players, including a couple of people from UK. And, um, uh, you know, I think uh, one of my mentors, John Dirk, and he's passed, unfortunately, but uh, he said, don't just treat runners, treat, you know, everybody that has foot and ankle problems. So, I, you know, I try, I, I don't limit myself as far as the sports. I treat a lot of dancers, partly because my daughter's a dancer as well. And I just enjoy helping people get back out to the, the activities they like to do, which is now more important than ever. We're seeing a lot of overuse injuries uh, because people can't go into their health club. So more people are running outside and they're running outside in bad shoes, bad form. So, and I think in another couple months, all of us who treat overuse injuries are going to be really busy. Yeah, I think that's the same. We we, we should say I mean, it's fine for people watching this this week, but if you're if you're coming to this in in months or years down the line, because that's the internet, we are right in the middle of the COVID nineteen pandemic. We're we're on lockdown completely in the UK. Uh, in the states, you've got a bit more freedom of movement, but yeah, it, it's it's an interesting point, isn't it? Um, yeah. So so Amal, you've done um, 
extensive research papers. I mean, I mean, if you just go on Google Scholar uh, and just put a, a Mars Saxena into the, the search title, uh, I mean, you've got 15, 20 pages worth of, uh, of, of things with your name in it. Um, and, and they vary across the surgery. You know, I, I even see you've done some stuff on the um, Alter G treadmill. Um, but the ones that would really catch our eye are the work you've done, particularly in the Achilles, the, the plantar fascia uh, world, and, and also medial tibial stress syndrome, amongst others. But I wonder if we could just drill down uh, a little bit onto the, onto the Achilles and, and, try and try and get from you, I suppose. You're someone that's operated on the Achilles. You're someone that's clearly used shockwave and studied both. If you get someone that comes to you with, with an Achilles tendon, A, when do you decide you're going to use shockwave and how do you, how do you make a decision about whether this person's going to need surgery or whether they're going to be okay with shockwave? Is there a timeline that you get involved with? Where, where would you take us uh, along that journey perhaps? Yeah, so um, I mean, I do. I actually do a lot of ac acute Achilles ruptures nowadays, much more than chronic Achilles surgery. So an acute rupture just basically would have surgery. So when consider using shockwave, you could use shockwave after perhaps to help uh, speed up the healing. Uh, but for chronic Achilles, meaning people who've had it more than six weeks, um, we offer shockwave pretty much right away. It's to me, it's like if uh, someone fell overboard. And on, a, on a boat in the ocean, if you uh, watch them struggle for a, a while, or do you just throw them the life, life preserver right away? Um, I did do one paper on plantar fasciopathy. If you treat a patient within three months, as opposed to waiting six months, they were statistically more likely to return to their full activity level. And, um, so, and they actually had better results. So early intervention is always better. Um, and, um, so I, I do that with, uh, you know, they need to probably try some of the other things at home, typically before they see me, like the eccentrics. A lot of people can do that on, you know, going on the internet, uh, inserts or heel list, proper shoes. And then um, we offer the shockwave and uh, we need to give it at least three months. And um, I typically don't operate, uh, you know, it's interesting, people uh, are sometimes people are surgically oriented or motivated, I should say, because um, I'm probably surgically oriented, but I'm not surgically motivated. Um, people are fearful that if they offer shockwave or if they do shockwave, then they won't get any surgery. Um, so I looked at the statistics from 2001 when we started electronic medical record to 2008, the percentage of people that I operated on that had Achilles tendinopathy. And that was when I didn't really use shockwave that much, uh, if at all. Um, that was 18% of the patients that had uh, surgery. Then I looked from 2008 to 2015, what percentage of people I operated on for chronic Achilles tendinopathy, and it went down to 11%. So people would say, oh, geez, you're doing less surgery, but the end value of this Achilles actually went up. It went up almost double. So you'll end up doing more surgery if you if you uh, sort of become that person for Achilles. and um, I, I like helping people, whether surgically or non-surgically. Uh, if you help someone non-surgically, that someone told them they needed to have surgery, the next patient that they, they they may refer will say, "Well, I'm I'm going to see you because I don't I don't know if I need surgery, and you didn't do surgery on my friend, and he got better." So they appreciate your honesty and say, "Look, we'll try this, and if it doesn't work, at least in my hands, my most of my surgical uh, outcomes, I actually have two big series coming out." On it, one on Achilles ruptures and one on insertional repair. And most of my Achilles outcomes are about 95 to 97 percent uh, getting people back to activity. So if you use the techniques I use, and I, I, I don't think I'm the only person who can do something. I, I don't think like that at all. I'm trying to teach people. And if people uh, use the techniques I use, which anybody can do, anybody can pick up a shockwave machine and use it as well. Um, so I don't have that type of attitude that you have to see me cause I'm the only one. Cause I'm at the point in my life where I try to teach as much as I can and share my knowledge. Um, so yeah, uh, with any fasciopathy, Achilles tendinopathy, we try to do early intervention. Um, and, um, 
overall, it seems like Shockwave seems to completely help at least 75% of the people. What we don't know is the people that we say there's 75% of people better, but then only about 10% are for Achilles and less than 5%, in my opinion, for plantar fasciae problems or really 3% ever really meet the criteria for surgery. So we don't know how those people are really doing or what they're doing. Um, sometimes they go from therapist to therapist to provider and all these different things. And, um, but the thing is evidence-based medicine pretty much shows shockwave is, is really one of the one or two or three at the most things that work for Achilles tendinopathy and plantar fasciopathy. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and reading your research papers and, and, and papers by other people, <clears throat> we always end up at this um, a, a fairly common statement at, at the end, which is that um, things like shockwave uh, should be considered before a surgical intervention. Shockwave has got a, a high value for, for the outcome of, of Achilles tendinopathy, plantar fasciopathy. Uh, shockwave could be a good alternative to, um, to surgery. And, and I know what it's like in the States, but in, in the UK, patients are less motivated to have surgery these days. I, I, I guess, you know, people are on Google more or whatever, I don't know, but it, it strikes me over my career, um, people used to come in saying, well, can you refer me for surgery? I, I'd like to get this operated on. And many, many more people come in saying, I've just had surgery on. Nowadays, they're saying, I've tried to avoid it. Please don't tell them I've got to go and have surgery. What else have you got? And that opens up, based upon the research, this, this immediate sort of buy-in to them wanting to go down something which, you know, extracorporeal outside the body uh, shockwave therapy. We're not cutting someone open. It's, um, I, 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 don't, I don't like the, the term um, non-invasive because I think we are invading the cells, but we're not, we're, it's non-surgical. So I think there's a buy-in from the, the public and there's a buy-in from the science, which makes it a really, really interesting proposition. The, the most enlightening thing that, that just came out there was the fact that your, your amount, your percentage of surgery had gone down since you've been using Shockwave, which as someone who doesn't do surgery, sounds really, really positive. But you hinted at the fact that people that are surgically motivated would probably be less likely to, to make those changes that that you have uh, uh, perhaps because you're more forward thinking. So what, 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 what do you feel about that? What do you feel about surgery for surgery's sake? We, we have a saying where, you know, if you go to a butcher's, you'll get meat. If you go to a baker's, you'll get bread. If you go to a surgeon, you'll get surgery. Um, what, what are your thoughts around that? You know, if we've got, if we've got allied healthcare professionals listening in that maybe feel the same as you and I do, uh, how do we manage that situation where people are surgically motivated? Yeah, well, um, I mean, everybody should be practicing evidence-based medicine, unfortunately, uh, particularly in the States. Not as many uh, providers practice evidence-based medicine. And, and um, since we have still a lot of fee-for-service insurance, people are you know, practicing experience-based medicine or financially-based medicine. Um, so that's just that's uh, going to be a change. I mean, maybe with this COVID thing, maybe they'll upend... Um, you know, healthcare and, and start looking at outcomes and, and uh, costs for getting a certain outcome. Um, it's, it, that's kind of change is tough. Um, yeah, we have a lot, a lot of uh, slow adopters. <clears throat> um, but again, you have to look at the evidence. You have to look at what is, uh, would you have it done yourself? You know, I had shockwave liquor treated my proximal hamstring strain in 2004. One treatment knocked it out. And that was back in 2004. So I think uh, as more people get exposed to it, their, their mindset, their head might wrap around a little better. The other thing with, for surgically um, motivated people, the shockwave has been shown to improve the outcomes of surgery. So you can use it certainly postoperatively as well. I use it postoperatively for ankle osteochondral defects. Um, sometimes I, I do some touch-up treatments for the Achilles to help speed up the healing. For the insertional Achilles, there has been some uh, animal studies showing that if you do the, treat the uh, insertion in the first two weeks post-surgery, um, that they have a better uh, healing response. So there's plenty of opportunity to improve your outcomes, even if you are surgically uh, motivated and want to take patients to surgery first. Um, 
yeah, that's a it's a tough if it's 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 a tough uh, paradigm to change for sure. But that, that that's quite a nice route in for for those people, isn't it? That well, we'll you know, surgeons like to look good, um, and and so you know, if we can if we can even just improve that scarring. I mean, I know a lot of people who feel that the surgery they had was really good because the scarring was so minimal. Therefore, you must be a great surgeon. Not even thinking. Yeah what went on the inside in, in I think around the world but I, I do think we suffer in the UK there's a lot of what we'd say naysayers around shockwave it doesn't work they've seen papers where shockwave didn't work I don't believe in the science uh, the results are too good uh, they've they've seen science uh, where there it can it can appeal to their viewpoint that it doesn't work and so they they will cite this study or that study and and, and so Given that, that you've produced a lot of this research and you've probably read most of it, uh, as I have, what, what do you think it is that compels people to, to want to dismiss Shockwave in the way that some people do? Yeah, you know, I get asked that, you know, patients come in and say, why don't more doctors have this? Why don't more doctors use that? That's, that's uh... And um, again, I think as what I brought up previously, people are... Um, you know, sometimes motivated by wanting to do more surgery. Some people don't have it and don't want to invest in it. Um, so that's, that's an issue also. Um, and uh, the other thing is that in the States, uh, just like in Europe, it's not covered by insurance. And patients are still uh, in that paradigm where they want to use their insurance to cover things. And the, it, the ironic thing is that most patients in America now that have fee-for-service insurance have uh, a high deductible, and that means the first $2,500 or even $5,000 or even higher is totally out of pocket. And so um, I did a, a survey of 12 orthopedic and podiatry practices on patients that uh, uh, had plantar fasciopathy and what their average... Uh, cost to the insurance company or the charges were in the uh, first six months before they decided to do shockwave. And that includes office visits, injections, orthotic devices, uh, just plain imaging, no MRI. And the average charges that they incurred was $2,300. And um, pretty much none of those things are going to have a good long-term outcome other than perhaps orthotics uh, I still use cortisone shots uh, occasionally. Uh, it's, it does seem to work better in the acute cases. And sometimes prior, if they have had shockwave and hadn't had any injection, I might do a uh, cortisone shot at least once to see if that knocks it out. Um, but anyway, the uh, average charges are $2,300. And so if shockwave is, is quite a bit cheaper than that, at least in California it is, um, why not try that first? Uh, since it's going to be out of pocket anyway. So it's just explaining and changing the mindset and the paradigm and that your insurance is not going to cover it any, anything anyway. So why not do what is most likely to work? That's why Ligger calls it, you know, it's the best first option. So, so that's how I post it. To, that's how I post it to doctors and to uh, patients. So. No, I, I, I like that. In, in um, I don't know if it's the same mistakes, but we've got, uh, a growing body of people that um, want to work the biopsychosocial model, which means that they're doing motivational interviewing, um, okay. the, the kind of work from, um, from the pain science group um, and, and, and talking about the fact that passive therapies just uh, create a reliance um, and it's not actually doing anything other than a short term outcome. The patient needs to take responsibility for that and uh, and so they are giving manual therapists or people that do passive uh, treatments a really really hard time and 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 i guess my thought process is is that for many many years i've been doing motivational interviewing i understand when someone's got a, a an incorrect relationship with pain and you deal with that but the science that that goes with um, the stuff that Laura Mosley's done and, and the like um, is is newer. It's it's less broad. It's less well known. 
than the evidence base we've got for things like shockwave which which supersedes injections and many surgeries in, in the amount of knowledge it's got so in the uk we're starting to get into a bit of a of a verbal fist fight over people that saying, well, if you're using shockwave, you're not a real therapist, you're, you're, you're just creating a reliance on the tools that you've got and you, you should be getting these people to understand that their pain isn't real and, 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 and. And, and so we're starting to fight a bit of a battle against people that want to prove that shockwave doesn't work. We've got a battle against people that say that, that no manual therapy works other than in the short term. And that hasn't been my experience. I'm, I'm assuming it hasn't been your experience. And, uh, and I like to think that those two models could fit together. Oh, by last year. Far right. If that I, I lost you there. <laughs> Uh, right, yeah, you, you're, you're back. We'll, we'll, we'll edit that bit out. But my point was, I, I don't know if you heard about the biopsychosocial model. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I tell, you know, a lot of patients are uh, reliant on that physical therapist. Uh, you know, the fact that they touch the patients makes a huge difference, right? So if um, that's why chiropractic, part of the reason why chiropractic works is because you're actually touching it, the patient. And um, the patient feels like uh, they need to have that reassurance. And, you know, the data on um, anxiety and depression in, in patients with chronic foot pain uh, shows 80% of the people have uh, yeah, higher levels of depression with uh, chronic, chronic foot problems. So the physiotherapist sometimes serves more as a psychotherapist. So I joke the PT is, you know, psychotherapist, not physiotherapist. Um, so there, there's, there's some value in that. Um, I tell patients that the evidence for actually treating the foot with physical therapy modalities is not super high, but the benefit from seeing the physical therapist is if you have imbalances and bad habits that, and uh, need strengthening and postural control. Um, I was just on a um, Zoom call with uh, another provider who practices and teaches spiral dynamics, which to me is is the real biomechanics of body movement um, is quite popular in Europe and we're trying to introduce it here in the United States. So definitely uh, adjusting and treating the motion uh, is important. I, um, you know, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. I, I don't feel that a lot of people, even though I'm a podiatrist, uh, need or custom orthotics and, or even orthotic at all. Um, so I think it's a combination of things and we have a lot of different approaches for different angles and we need to just combine and see where the evidence is. I think Karsten has a really nice slide showing all the uh, interventions that are necessary in sports medicine uh, from the physical therapist to the, you know, the surgeon or the non-operative non uh, person and the, and the coach and the trainer and the psychotherapist and, you know, the family. <laughs> so there's a lot of, a lot of things that take, uh, need to be taken into account in getting patients better. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that completely. Um, you, um, you actually, I see you were involved in the, one of the early things that, that I was, was on the per periphery involved with, which was the ASSERT protocol. The, the Mephullies were really championing the ASSERT protocol, which is a widespread, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, lots and lots of practitioners were treating with shockwave and putting all their data into this central system. Um, and and I, I note on one of your um, discussion points on that, you were, you were primarily drilling in on, on the Achilles and saying that, that if people are well trained and they've got shockwave equipment and they're using it within the confines of that, we tend to be getting some, some good outcomes. Um, the ASSERT protocol, one of the, the, I guess, weaknesses that I felt it had is it seemed to be suggesting to me that the greatest results seem to be coming at 12 months and then 24 months which for for most patients were like well, i'm not waiting that long yeah. whereas, whereas these days we seem to think that 12 weeks is where we're kind of getting the the peak of the treatment effect it within clinic i find people anecdotally feeling so much better five six weeks so uh, where do you feel we get the maximum benefit from shockwave therapy from when we first treat through to 
three months, six months, 12 months, two years? What, what do you think the long-term benefits are of shockwave therapy? Well, uh, a couple things. Uh, definitely it takes 10 to 12 weeks to remodel the tissue. So that's sort of the first phase. And, and that, you know, if the patients are feeling better, part of that might be, uh, you know, mental or psychological. You kind of broke the, the pain cycle. Um, the thing is, uh, realistically, you need to go out at least a year to see how well they're doing because part of their uh, psychological uh, improvement is based on their ability to do their exercise and get back to full training, for instance, if they're a you know, recreational or, or higher level athlete. So unless they're training full on, they won't feel like they're better. So they could have no pain in their Achilles at 12 weeks, but I'm not running 70 plus miles a week and I'm not better than that. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you need to go out uh, for a year or more. And um, there is still uh, some component of truth to uh, time heals all wounds. And so if you did nothing, certain percentage of patients would get better after a year. And we know that's not exactly true because Nicola did a paper on Achilles tendinopathy and he found out a year if he did nothing, still only 20% people got better. Um, I think the main thing is, uh, um, it, I think you need to evaluate apples to apples. And so most studies on surgery, for instance, have a one to two year outcome uh, to make the true assessment. So if you want to compare shockwave to surgery, you really got to go out one to two years. So that, that's part of the motivation behind that. Um, and, um, so that, that's part of that there. And, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I totally answered your question, but uh, I do have patients that want to come back yearly if they're training for an event. High school kids come back every year uh, for uh, shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome. Um, they just, and basketball players as well. And so that's something that they know it helps. So they just continue to come back and there's no harm in that. I, I we've, we've done that many times for many high school kids. So that's, that's kind of a, kind of a neat phenomenon. So no, I, think, I, think, I think it does are yeah. just really good early responders. Like Galen Rupp is a really, and Paula Ratcliffe too, they're, they're all fast responders. And I don't know if it's because they're elite athletes and their tissue turnover is very quick and remodeling is very quick. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I, I do, I think in a couple of my papers, I've shown that elite athletes get back to activities faster, at least with surgery. Um, but yeah, there's, there's some people who are just faster responders with interventions and, and there are also some people who are non-responders as well. So yeah, it's very small, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting, uh, idea of the, the non-responder and the fast responder. And but the people that I work with is a largely athletic population. And so I think that sometimes my anecdotal results are skewed a little bit by exactly that, that phenomenon. It was interesting you mentioned medial tibial stress syndrome because that's that's something that I uh, have drawn a, a close relationship with using shockwave uh, almost as a healing accelerator as opposed to the conservative methods or, or the standardized treatment for that. Um, what's, what's your research shown about MTSS and, and shockwave? Well, um, actually, one of the first papers I ever published was on um, medial tibial stress syndrome and that the, uh, the medial shin where people are having pain is actually uh, the uh, flexor digitorum longus uh, muscle originates, not the posterior tib. And you have ten tension or traction on the fascia. Um, so early in uh, or in the late 80s, early in my career, people were using air cast ankle braces or leg braces for shin splints and stress fractures. And I continue to use them. So I, if someone has really bad shin splints or medial tibial stress syndrome or a stress fracture, they'll wear an air cast type of brace. They come in various heights, depending on where the pain location is. I have them start an eccentric strengthening program. Um, one of the key things about orthotics, patients a lot of times say, I have orthotics, it's not helping my shin splints. The reason why the orthotic devices don't help most of the running and jumping sport athletes is because their orthotic device ends proximal to the metatarsal heads. And um, the forefoot is continuing to pronate or collapse uh, through the end stage of gait. 
And so orthotic devices need to be modified so they're built up immediately underneath the hallux. And I, I know that goes counterintuitive to all the people who believe in a functional hallux limitus and uh, that the big toe needs to drop down or the first metatarsal head needs to drop down in order to resupinate. The problem is in, in running sports, the le lever arms are uh, too strong to overcome for most people. And so that's why you need to continue to support and resist the pronation underneath the forefoot in the uh, orthotic device or in the end stage of gait. And so I use that those comp in combination with the uh, shockwave or technically I use sound wave for most of my medial tibial stress syndrome patients. Um, so I use the radial device for that. If, if they happen to have a stress fracture itself, then I will use true shockwave on the stress fracture side as well. Yeah, and then we have them. We have work on the other strengthening, like the core strengthening and stuff like that. So, the radial device is a bit tender over a, a tibial um, bone if, uh, if if they've got pain. But anyway, I, and and I agree. I think focus on the bone tissue and uh, and radial pressure wave on the <clears throat> on on the soft tissues. Um, in, in terms of uh, of research papers, you can choose one of your own if you want, but. What, what do you think has been um, a key piece of literature? What, what would you say has been a seminal paper in the development of, of shockwave in, in foot and ankle? Um, well, I don't know if it's a study or um, there have been some uh, recent review articles in 2018 in JBJS and Adam 1040 uh, in his group uh, in 2019. You know, I think... I think for the people who are novices, I think reading some of their review articles that go through the, all the studies and, and the level of evidence, and I think that those would be sort of the the big articles to read. Uh, Ligger, Gersmeyer, and uh, I was a co-author, but I had minimal involvement, but they did one on just on Achilles um, overview. So I think looking at the review articles, uh, evaluating shockwave is are probably the best as far as getting an idea and a handle on shockwave. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, it's a good, I, I love a meta-analysis because it, it straightens out some of the, the lines on there. If we could, um, we could sort of finish up a little bit with talking about, uh, let's say the, the key protocols. So you mentioned a little bit about medial tibial stress syndrome if we if we focus down on the achilles which has had so much research around it do you have a go-to protocol for for shockwave number of shocks the energy flux bar pressure do you use radial do you use focus what would be your go-to protocol on achilles so for achilles i use both i use the focus device first i usually use it at uh, 0.15 for at least 2000 pulses i usually do a 500 pulse ramp up and then 2000 pulses. Um, and um, the uh, frequency is six uh, hertz. And then I, uh, and I use it on the maximal tender area. And then I use the radial device for um, also 2,500 pulses at 2.4 bar for at 11 hertz. Um, so that's my shockwave protocol. And then if they're not having pain doing eccentrics, I'll have them do eccentrics. I'll have them elevate the heels if they haven't tried. Have them stop stretching. Uh, I don't like them to stretch, particularly with insertional Achilles. And I don't like them to do the eccentrics beyond a flat surface on, with they have insertional Achilles as well. Um, if they have a lot of hind foot varus or hind foot valgus, I'll, um, I'll uh, have them uh, institute some type of orthotic or insert. Um, as I said, I don't think a lot of people need custom ones, but uh, certainly we try it. Uh, if the pain is lateralized or medialized more, an orthotic might help more. Uh, so that, that's really interesting. I, I love the, the combined approach and, and I use it myself and I'd love to see more, more studies coming out of looking at a combined approach versus just using one of them, them singularly. Um, Amal, you've been a, a wealth of knowledge to us. I'm mindful of the time because I know you've got a another group to to go to straight after this so we're very very thankful you've taken this this time out uh, kind of just after your breakfast absurdly because it's coming up to our dinner time um 
Is, is there anything else you think that we, we perhaps have, have missed off? Is there anything that, that you think we, we, we need to add to this? Are you happy with that? Yeah, no, I think yeah, you covered quite a bit of ground. So it was, it was fun. I appreciate it. I always like to finish off by understanding a little bit about the man outside of, uh, of all of your great work. What are, what's the thing that defines you outside of, of being a, a surgeon, a podiatrist and a, a medical practitioner? What, what's your greatest thing that you get up to outside of work? Uh, well, I, you know, I think I'm a, I'm a good, uh, good friend to people. I, I try to help everybody. So that's my motivation in life. Um, I got, I have a good family. I got a good friend network and, uh, I like working out. I like, uh, cooking because I like eating. Um, so those are the, those are the things I look forward to. Hopefully, uh, we can meet in person, uh, sometime this year, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> So, yeah, we're uh, hoping to, aren't we? But uh, a lot of travel has been cancelled. And, yeah. and you mentioned uh, that, that you used to run a lot. You still run now? Um, I run very little. I run about 10 to 12 miles a week. Uh, one run outside on dirt and two runs on the Alter G. Um, and I bike about 100 to 150 miles a week. I used to do duathlons. Um, haven't really done too many races. I had a bad bike accident last year and just haven't been able to pull things together to race, but, uh, I don't live to race. I live to just, you know, I, I say I train for life. So. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a nice, nice place to be. Uh, uh, a bit like you, I, I was a kayak paddler for feels like half my life. And, and I can't remember the last time I sat in a kayak, which is, is really sad, but life moves on, doesn't it? And you, you yeah. get other interests and, and other things. Um, oh, well, thank you. I think we, we've run out of time. So, uh, honestly, it's 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 been a favourite of mine to, uh, and I was waiting patiently to to get to do this interview because you're a, a, a big figure in shockwave in shockwave science and and also in the podiatry world. And uh, it wouldn't be right if we didn't mention our common friend Trevor Pryor as well, who uh, found out we were chatting on on Facebook and it blew his mind. So, um, well, thank you very very much for your time, and uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Okay, cheers.